coming up on Theater Talk. Is Elizabeth missing the profound meaning of this play, The River Charles? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I had texts from people saying, could you please explain the river to me? And I was like, no. <laughs> no. I don't know what happened. I don't care. I checked out. <laughs> it's about fishing. That's all you could say. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation and the Honorable Thomas Mercer Ray. Happy New Year. This is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And we are midway through the Broadway season. And so we thought we would bring our friends, the critics, on to uh, assess what they have seen so far this, um, this season. Uh, welcome to Theater Talk, my good friend Elizabeth Vincentelli from the New York Post. Welcome. Hello. Charles Isherwood of the New York Times, looking very Timesian there today, I must say, Charles. Hi there. <laughs> nice to see you. I don't know what that means. No. <laughs> I don't think it's a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> and the relaxed Jesse Green from Swing and Hipster New York Magazine. Welcome to the The culture Talk. vulture. Uh, that's me. I was called that even before I started okay. working. All right. Uh, before we uh, talk about some of the shows, I do want to address, because we just saw it the other night, and it's still fresh in the minds of many people, I'm sure, the Peter Pan broadcast on NBC. Your, you, your heart looks like it's sinking there, Jesse. It didn't go, not, I, not I, as successful as The Sound of Music last year. I appreciate yeah. it because I haven't often had the opportunity to use the words turgid and awful <laughs> in the same <laughs> sentence in a review recently. So there's that. Right, Elizabeth, you were not uh, won over by this. Uh, this was not horrible, and it was not exciting either. It was incredibly boring. Yeah, I thought the was... most interesting part, though, and Charles, you didn't see it, but I'm sure you DVR'd it, and you're going to watch it. And I don't know, life is too short. <laughs> right, but the, the only thing I thought was interesting about it was Christopher Walken forgetting his lines. I mean, there were some very tense moments where he just sort of stared out into space, and and but... uh, Christian Borel had to feed him the line. The problem with Peter Pan is that they picked a show that was technically very, very challenging. And everybody was so nervous to mess up, basically. To, they, they were tentative. They were, they were frozen in fear, you could tell. I'm not sure that it's feasible anymore to do what was done so well in the early days of television, both because of the financial situation, the need to get bigger stars than can actually do the material properly, but also because, for instance, with Peter Pan, those performers, uh, Mary Martin and Cyril Richard, had done the show on Broadway by that yeah. point. So the production was already in good shape. They adapted it. These people looked, as you said, Elizabeth, like, like they were terrified of whether they would get through the next sentence or two. Now, Charles, something I think would be play really well a live broadcast uh, <laughs> is The Last Ship with Sting, <laughs> which uh, you are sort of, uh, you were in favor of that show. You reviewed well, that I show. Think you liked we, that show. We all wanted to root for it in the sense that it's a serious musical with big ambition, a beautiful score, I think. Mm -hmm. And yet, it's also very dark, and you know, it's about a shipyard closing down, and it has some vaguely mystical aspects. And uh, unfortunately, I don't think audiences want that yeah. on Broadway. This is why they Sting want, is going into it now. Yeah, they want something peppier, and now Sting, I mean, I didn't really think he'd do it, but it seems like an act of desperation to keep the thing alive. Yeah. Um, but I do, you know, I wanted it to be better than it was, let's put it that way. I think a lot of us probably felt that way. Yeah, how'd you feel about Elizabeth? Pretty much the same way I, I thought, and and... I really cannot stand Sting's music in general. Really? Uh, no, I, I really can't stand him, but uh, I really enjoyed the show. I thought actually his music worked perfectly well in a theatrical context. Actually, the most appealing part of the show is the, the, the romance. Mm -hmm. And I hear they're changing the commercials to reflect that a little bit more. I think that's a very successful part of the show. The whole shipbuilding thing, I mean, if I see another like singing in the pub, <laughs> I know. Doing a jig after a long oh my day, God. Long day I, in the shipyards. No, once was enough. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse, do you think so, uh, uh, this show can survive into the new year? I mean, Sting is in it till uh, January 10th, maybe a little longer. Well, so it can that. survive at least until Til then, yes. <laughs> um, I'm not good at, you know, at forecasting those things. Every, and, and I would like to see it succeed for the same reasons that Charles uh, outlined, but... Um, you just can't hope for too much when things aren't right. The music is very nice. I think pretty much every word in it, though, is is substandard, mm -hmm. both in the book and in the lyrics. Uh, the, the lyrics just are not theater lyrics. They don't, they don't, you know, those kind of singer-songwriter generalities and banalities yeah, yeah, yeah. don't tell a story, and they're very pretty. 
I liked it when I saw it as a concert. But I, I don't know. I don't see a long future for it. Now, another one that's struggling, but Charles, you loved it and gave it a, a great review, is uh, Sideshow, which I went to see the other night. And frankly, I was a little skeptical because I didn't like the original. But I, I quite like this production. And yet it, too, is not really hitting with, a, with an audience. Yeah, I think, it, you know, it's a very dark musical once again. Ultimately, it's about, you know, these conjoined twins, not <laughs> the most, you know, joyous subject to begin with, and they don't end up happily ever after, <laughs> or separately. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think that's one of the problems. This is a much more vital production, I think. The other one was stylized and sort of stark. They tried to sort of brighten it up and make it a little bit more gothic and at the same time more razzle-dazzly, but I still think that audiences resist, you know, this sort of macabre subject matter. Also, it doesn't have stars. It's not based on a movie. I mean, and those, you know, those are two things you're, it's an uphill battle already. Elizabeth, is this uh, really a uh, neglected masterpiece of the American musical theater? No, <laughs> no, it's a, it's an oddity, like, like it's subject. I actually disagree that the show is dark. I think the show is really, uh, try to put a kind of pep, you know, a peppy tone into a dark subject. Uh, if it was really dark, it would have gone until their death, which was horrible. Right, they died broke, didn't they? Yeah. They were abandoned uh, in some small Carolina town, I think, and had to work that's as cashiers. That. Just they they work cashier. So that's a fun, you know, I mean, but that, that would be dark. But I thought the show, yeah, they pushed the razzle-dazzle uh, of their career as vaudevillians, and, uh, and I thought the male leads actually were very weak, uh, very bland. Uh, but it's, a, it's, it's not a good show, it's a fascinating show. It's a really intriguing show. And I thought the staging was really wonderful. Uh, Bill Condon yeah. comes from, from the movies and uh, it's a very, very impressive debut uh, as a stage director. Uh, it's a really, he's a very good eye, which is not that obvious, you would think, but it's not. Right. Um, what do you think, Jesse, about the, uh, the score? Because the reason this show has kept alive all this time is because people fell in love with the cast album. I, I was I was never a fan of the show. I think it's a lot of hooey, and <laughs> um, and uh, I would love to see the one where we see the end of their lives, the way where she one of them dies first and the other one can't get out of bed. I'm finally alone. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, the only thing going for it, aside from the staging, which was very good, is that there are some really great bravura numbers for the two women and those two actresses sing the hell out of them and that's fun. I, I, yeah. that's, but that's the only thing I think that could possibly bring people in because everything about it is kind of repellent right. other than that. Now a play that I, I loved uh, this year, Charles, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, which is here from, uh, from London. Uh, spectacular production, I thought, and, uh, and, and a fascinating play. Do you agree? Yeah. I thought it was much better here actually than in London. I thought in London it was sort of underwhelmed. I think this production gets it absolutely right. The actor in the central role, Alex Sharp, I think. Yeah, very is, good as the boy with Asperger's. He's incredibly moving, and yet unsentimental, and uh, I think the staging is very dynamic, which you don't always find with shows adapted from novels. Um, I think it's a great Broadway entertainment. I don't think it's a profound play, but it's engrossing. It sort of gets everything right. Were you moved by it, Elizabeth? Yeah, I really loved it. Uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's engrossing, and it never talks down to the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, it assumes the audience is going to follow. I was telling a friend that if this had been an American show, they would ha we would have had a scene in the school where they explain yeah. what's going on with, <laughs> with the kid, you know. And here, there's no explaining. It's, the kid is. He just he is, the way, he is the way he is, and you just go along with it, and you understand. Mm -hmm. And the show is very good at putting you in his head yeah, yeah. and making you understand what he's experiencing. Are you w with them on this? Or? Yeah, I think we're unanimous on this. I, I thought that... Uh, in fact, it was in some ways better than the novel. Even not, I didn't see it. Oh, I agree. The production actually, yeah. in London, it it did something rather different from the novel and uh, brought a kind of sadness uh, at the end that was earned and more interesting than I, than you might expect from an upbeat kind of Broadway production. And and the other thing I'd say is that it's staged like a musical. So I think it does have a chance if it's marketed well. Mm. Would you prefer that you die in the end, actually? <laughs> yeah. the it's not dark enough for you, is it? Attached to his rat. <laughs> it's, it's sentimental. The only thing I want to but. disagree with you, Charles, is I, I think it's deeply profound. And I, I, I don't remember when I've been so so wrenched by a, a show as the end of Act I saw One. you. and You, you, you saw you, me. You, I was a mask. Yes, you were. Although, I have to say, 
Okay, never mind. That's <laughs> <laughs> the usual the way she that's is. Right. That's how I always see her. At <laughs> Forever in tears. Um, now, I thought this one missed a little bit here, and it, I think it's a great, great play, but I was a little disappointed in this production. Uh, Edward Albee's A Delicate Balance. Uh, is it a masterpiece, or is it a lot of hooey, Charles? I think it's a great play. This production, I don't think, really gelled in a weird way. Some of the acting was good at times, and then somebody else would be off. Um, John Lithgow, Glenn Close. Glenn Close, Lindsay Duncan, who, you know, I think is fantastic, but, you know, she kept reverting when I saw it to a British accent, which sort of took me out of the play. Um, Claire Higgins and Bob Balaban were pretty good, but I really felt they were all in sort of different plays, and it never really sort of came together for me. You're feeling it on this, Elizabeth? Yeah, I, I agree that the staging also was very static. First, I think it's what I call the couch play, where there's a couch in the middle, and they always end up spending like two thirds of the time like on the couch. It's just so Don't incredibly boring. the bar. <laughs> the bar and the couch. It's um, back and forth from the bar to the couch, and and you know. But that's the that's trips. the play all be wrote, and and he was it satirizing is. to some extent that kind of drawing room comedy sort of stuff. Yes, but, uh, turning it into drawing room tragedy. But there's no awareness. It seems like there's no awareness on stage that this is what's going on. So he then well, I liked being... it better than you two. A friend of mine went to see an early uh, preview of it. It was the typical um, matinee lady audience. And at the end of the um, first act, this woman came up to my friend. She said, what are they afraid of? I don't understand this. <laughs> <laughs> and we should say for people who don't know the play, it's about this comfortable upper class family. And the neighbors come next door. And the neighbors are terrified now of being alone. And they kind of move into the house. I. I... I found that existentially dreadful, which seems to be my thing today, and yet I thought it was really very funny, which an Albee play must be. As a big fan of existential nihilism, I, <laughs> I would have expected to love this, but I, it completely left me cold. Now, speaking of existential, you can take it with you, a Kaufman and Hart play, which has some, I don't know, would you say bohemian or existential qualities to no. this No. No? <laughs> no. But, <laughs> Do you like this whole play? That's the expert. I, on <laughs> <laughs> the expert on existential nihilism. <laughs> no, it's uh, one of the uh, founding, you know, texts of, of the screwball comedy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love that revival. I think it's, uh, I felt really lucky to be able to see all those actors on the same stage. James Earl Jones. And yeah, well, you Mark know, Lincoln. he's kind of like the straight man in a way. But uh, I'm thinking Christian Nielsen and Rose Byrne was terrific. Uh, and of course, the wonderful Annalie Asher, who's my, I think is the new Judy Holiday. Uh, she's absolutely terrific. And uh, everybody, it's such a great cast. And they're all, you know, Julie Halston. Very funny, Julie Halston. Um, Charles, did you laugh at all at this uh, production? Uh, intermittently, I'm sure I did. Um, <laughs> you know, I thought it was a decent, production of a play that is showing its age a bit. I mean, the whole, we're so madcap, and isn't that fascinating thing is a little bit, I mean, you see that on television all the every, time. Every, every other hour. Every other sitcom, it's about some crazy family. Does this production make the case that this is a great classic American comedy? No, that case no, was made no. by its existence, and it's having lasted this long. I think it makes the case that it is still possible to produce these chestnuts if you're very careful. God bless them if they make a little money, you know, maybe we'll get a chance to see some of the foundational American plays, which indeed have become the basis of every television show on earth, but it's good to see where they came from. And I think it's doing very well because they're bringing in Richard Thomas and Anna Shlumsky to extend the run. The other one now, it's only a play, which uh, is the big, big hit of the season with like 10 million plus advance and Nathan Lane and Matthew Broderick. This play is so depressing. I can't even, oh. Why? It's, because it's such a hack, a hack job. The writing is so lazy because dropping names does not a joke make. Yeah. And that's all what ha that happens in, in this show. It's very frustrating, very frustrating. Um, it's just lazy writing because it makes no sense. The characters make no sense. And you have to have some internal logic mm -hmm. to, to a play for it to work and be funny. There's a huge problem in Matthew Broderick, who's not funny at all. So Nathan Lane works overtime. I was really depressed. And now we should say that this is a play that takes place on the opening night of a Broadway show. And Matthew Broderick is the playwright, if I remember correctly. Yes, he's the... And Nathan Lane yes. is his best friend, who's a sitcom star. And, and right. they're all in some fancy house awaiting the reviews. Yeah. With a critic, by the way, who, who comes to the opening night parties. Is this realistic in your world, Charles? Are you hanging I around am Matthew? always going, of course. <laughs> Nathan and I are like this. <laughs> what do you make uh, of this play? Well, you know, I had heard very bad advance word, was not expecting much. I don't think it's a 
good play. I thought they did what they could with it. Nathan Lane is such a comic genius that he kept me entertained throughout the thing. I thought there was some other good performance in, his, in it, mm -hmm. too. Um, but still, I agree, it's a fairly trivial piece of writing. Um, certainly, it was disappointing that Terrence McNally lays lips together, teeth apart, which is actually, I think, a quite good play, yeah. produced this mm -hmm. season off Broadway, didn't get this kind of production. Um, and it was so it was sort of like the, the bad play got all the attention and the good one was sort of not done very well. So what do we make of the fact that we did and not find it very funny, although Nathan Lane, I mean, there's, there were some of the performances made up for what might be seen as a lack of humor in the writing, but, <laughs> but the people in the theater are finding it funny. People are, that's They're it. screaming. Yeah. People are, I, I mean, I sat there, it was one of those experiences where you have, where the more the audience goes crazy, the, the, the more you hate it, because you are just not in on any of the laughs. So the I, Lenny uh, and Tenor phenomenon. Hey, I want to go to another play that depressed uh, Elizabeth. Oh, God. And that is <laughs> The River. Oh, well, another, another big No, that one did not Jackman. depress me. That one made me angry. Why? Right. Because You're I a thought. Hugh Jackman hater? No, I love Hugh Jackman, actually. I, I, I love him. I'm a big fan. But it's, why did he bother with his non-play? It is so incredibly pretentious. Actually, pretentious, I don't like using the word pretentious because that's not the right word there. But uh, <laughs> Because you are pretentious, darling. <laughs> that's, that's right. As all uh, critics are. That's right. Um, it is a play that is so full of itself, and it's about so little. It it's is about a man so who, clumsy. a man who has the cabin by the river, and he brings girlfriends there, and he fishes and cooks them dinner. There's a lot of talk about fishing, and if there's one thing more boring than fishing, it's talk about fishing. <laughs> and fishing is not a window into philosophy and and life. Fishing is fishing. And well, 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 well. If, if you if you go to well, how about Moby Dick? No, and if you go to well, Henry David Thoreau, fishing is a bigger is fish, and not a fish actually. That's but. right, that's right. <laughs> Charles. It uh, is completely bloated, which is odd because it's only an, an hour and a half long. too, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and so devoid of life that it really made me angry. Is Elizabeth missing the profound meaning of this play, The River, Charles? Uh, no. <laughs> I had texts from people saying, "Could you please explain the river to me?" And I was like, "No." <laughs> yeah. I don't know what happened. I don't care. I checked out. <laughs> it's about fishing. That's all you could say. <laughs> and why well, do you think Hugh Jackman was attracted to this 85-minute triviality? As well, a, a play well, doesn't have to be good to offer good roles. I mean, this pl that play will be done in scene study class mm -hmm. for the rest of eternity. Every, every cool. kid at the Yale Drama School is going to be... Is going to be making the oh, trout. absolutely. It's the got pedal. stuff to do with your hands. It's, <laughs> it's show off your bicep. And we should say for people, Hugh Jackman bones and cooks a fish. And he's going <laughs> around, the, it's in the round, and he's going around and fixing the fish and stuffing it. And then he washes the... Well, uh, the funniest thing is I was leaving and I spoke to your partner, Andy Myer, and he, I said, oh, now I know how to make a fish. And he said, well, he didn't rinse the fennel enough. <laughs> I thought that was... Because that's all you were looking at That's was, the kind of play it is. Yeah. You notice things like... Yeah, he's cooking a fish. He didn't rinse the fennel. Okay, it, it has to be said. There, it is... This is a play by a really fine playwright. Jazz Butterworth. It, 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 um, Jerusalem, which... Completely overrated. Uh, I'm beginning to wonder about it, frankly. <laughs> and there we are. Really overrated. <laughs> uh, all right, we've got another big star who's packing them in at uh, the, uh, the Booth Theater, uh, Bradley Cooper. Another kind of an acting exercise play, if you will, The Elephant Man, where, uh, you know, he takes his shirt off and he <laughs> contorts himself and he talks fight like this. Is there anything to this play or is it just for a star to show that he can act? You're the replacement. Well, <laughs> that's right. I can You're play. ready. I am. Elizabeth? Uh, it's not a very good play, but it is, uh, it's not a good play, but it's a great vehicle mm -hmm. for, uh, for a handsome man who has something to prove. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> um, and... It's a very actory part right. where you see the acting a mile away, and the trick is to reach the audience through that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the play is very. Does Bradley Cooper hard. succeed though in this acting exercise? I, I think he's very good. I didn't find it transcendent, but I thought he was very good, and the production is very good. It's a very kind of sleek, but not overly sleek mm -hmm. uh, production. It's very well done. Patricia Clarkson is wonderful, and she hasn't been on Broadway in a long time, I think 20 years almost or something like that, mm. which is surprising. But uh, So it's a good production, but I, I wasn't moved. I, I didn't cry, for instance, and I tend to cry. I'm a crier. Now but I'm shocked. 
No, I, I, I am a crier. I can accept. But. I'm a crier. I did tear up a little bit when he goes, please help me. Uh, but, uh, you mean when he went, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay. Sounds but like not, you're talking about the fly. Help me. See, he didn't go into a full-blown, you know, yeah. get out your handkerchief moment. Does Bradley Cooper show us he's a serious stage actor in this production? He's very committed to the Yeah, to the I, Yeah, and... and He's been on stage before. It's it's not yes. like he grew up in a cage in Hollywood, you know. <laughs> so I'm I'm not very surprised about that. Um, I was pleased uh, with the whole production, as you said, and we also should mention Alessandra Nivola, very good actor, who plays Treves, the doctor. Who he's just a great male actor, who's really delivers. He's sexy. He's smart. Uh, and uh, the production. And he never looks like he's trying too hard. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's very comfortable. It's very well balanced. It's such a compelling topic, and uh, I thought Bradley Cooper was wonderful. I was very, I was surprised because I just wasn't expecting him to be so good. But it it they the, for instance they show pictures of the Elephant Man. They bring in the real I, John. Eric. I, see, Joseph I almost Eric. wish they wouldn't show the pictures oh, of the real I, one because I think you have to project more, and that's us seeing the slides of the real one. Is, is a crutch. I think it is a crutch. I think the actor is the one who has to make us see, because everybody, you know, the, the, the other characters in the play, like, see him and recall in horror. They're like, people are fainting and insulting him. And, and But if, if people don't see the photos of, of Joseph Merrick, how he really was, you, you can't imagine it. Well, that's, that's the, the actor's thing. job. You can't imagine That's it. the actor's job. I'm sorry, you have to, and, and the play, you have Which to Which is why it's it. so strange that the tradition is that it's played by beautiful young, or beautiful well, men. Well, that's the thing, though, is say, you know, that, that's, that's, a, that's well, the dialogue. I think ironic commentary. <laughs> well, but I and think a once you start... person has to play a hideous person. That's, once you start the point looking play, through Jesse. that, the play be, sort of begins to fall apart. So well, there's not much of a play there to begin with. Come on. Uh, there's it's, there's it's good solid. It's, it's well made. <laughs> and it's a great know, story. Kind of we got to wrap it up, but I want to ask you guys, uh, what are you looking forward to uh, in the the latter half of the Broadway season? I know, Charles, um, uh, you you are on your way to uh, London, to I think you're going to be talking to Helen Mirren, who's coming in the audience. Yeah. Have you seen that uh, production yet? I saw the anti-live right. production. National it's very Theater entertaining. Live. It's quite quite a charming play. It's not... It's a bit like The Queen, but a little bit more entertaining. I mean, the movie The Queen. But Helen Mirren is wonderful, isn't Helen it? Helen Mirren looks to be amazing. But there's a lot of British stuff coming. I mean, I can't say I'm looking forward to two parts of Wolf Hall. <laughs> what is that? I mean, what is that, three and a the half The Hillary Mental uh, novel, yeah. It's a London heavy spring season, I think. There's also the Skylight, which I am looking forward to. Wonderful play by David Hare. Well, with David Hare play, that's, that's emotional. I mean, so many of his plays are cerebral, right. political. But this is a, a skylight. Is you say that like it's a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jesse, anything on your uh, uh, list of things? Well, since you've covered the British imports, uh, I'm very much looking forward to the transfer from off Broadway of the musical Fun Home. Uh, based What's on... that about? <laughs> well, you're going to love this one. Let me just <laughs> let's start with the that it takes place in a family funeral home. Oh God. Okay, <laughs> and the father's gay and the daughter's a lesbian, and you're you're just really there for this. But it's terrific. It <laughs> it was done at the public theater last year. I don't know. Maybe I don't know if you guys liked it or not. But Jean uh, just, I Jean liked Tesori. it. Janine no, Tesori. Lisa you didn't Brown. care for it, Charles. Mm -mm. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I admired it. But wow. I did not I, think that it was uh, structurally very well put together. I, uh, I, I agree with Charles. Mm. It sounds I like, liked it, but I didn't love it. It sounds to me like this is another one that's going to be like a sideshow or last ship. It's going to move to, to Broadway with a good review from Jesse Green, and nobody's going to go buy tickets to see it. It's going to be a hard sell. It, it is a hard but, sell, and they know that, and they, but, they put it in the smallest is, theater on Broadway. Which is not a, you know... But it's been a very weak season for new musicals, yeah. at least so far. Are you looking forward to any, is there a musical coming in the spring that you think is going to be exciting, Elizabeth? Musicals? The show that I'm really looking forward to seeing again in the spring, are we talking Broadway? Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to Hand to God. I don't even know what that which is. Which is, Hand to God is a very surprising transfer. Uh, it started at Ensemble Studio Theater, which is tiny, like a few years ago. And then it kind of worked its way up to a run at MCC. Mm -hmm. Of Broadway, and it's about this uh, Christian teen who goes to a uh, a Christian ministry, a puppet ministry, and he has this hand puppet who's, which is kind of either demonic or a projection of the. Anyway, it is completely insane and one of the funniest things I've seen in years, um, and features a fantastic and 
I would say Tony Worthy performance by Stephen Boyer as the as the, the puppet, the, as the kid. Well, both as the kid, <laughs> he creates <laughs> these two very distinct characters, basically talking to his hand the entire time, and it's absolutely fantastic. Hmm. And yeah. I can't believe they're transferring it. It's it's going to Broadway. It's going to Broadway. Wow. Have you guys seen it? I've seen it twice. And what do you think, Charles? Uh, I'm with you on this one. <laughs> Talk we're, to we're the hand. Rare yeah. accord. You, uh, oh, you like this? Oh, I think it's, it's a very funny play. I, whether it's incredible. Whether it's on Broadway is another story. Well, uh, but, you know, it'll be nice to see a new comedy on Broadway. You don't really see very many of those. All right, you heard it's it here first on Theater Talk. Hand to God is the show to watch in the spring. All right, Jesse Green from New York Magazine. Thank you for being our guest tonight at Theater Talk. Charles Isherwood of the New York Times. Good to see you. Have fun in London. Thank you, thank Give you. my best to the Queen, Helen. <laughs> Will do. And my friend Elizabeth Vincentelli from The Post. Thank you for the recommendation of Hand to, well, to God. I'm sure you'll like it. It's demonic puppets. It's right totally up. up your alley. <laughs> right up my alley. <laughs> thank you all for being our guest tonight on Theater Talk. It's all right. It's all right. What was that thing that they used to it's do? It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Freeze, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, plus public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency, and the Theater Development Fund's Technical Accessibility Program, which helps provide closed captioning. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you, and good night.